beyond the Delmarva <laughs> uh, Peninsula and, and then both uh, found that the Eastern shore and, and even this little pocket of the Eastern shore sort of starts to draw you back and, and you start to feel this pull from, from the soil and the water and, and the people. And, and when you have gone out and had other experiences and brought, you know, kind of the, the, the sum of yourself that, that developed in this place out to the wider world. Um, and, and then you, add to that with, with what you find out there and bring it back, it, it feels really important, I think, and special. And um, to me, at least, it, it really does feel kind of like a privilege to be able to have that double perspective. Um, and I know that Kyle is really here to talk to us about his painting and uh, I think he's going to show us some of his work and, and to talk about his perspective as expressed in that way. But um, I think that he may also share some of that feeling that I'm trying to articulate um, that, that is maybe everybody feels that way no matter where they grow up. But uh, I think there's something different here, something special um, because of the history and because of uh, I think the fact that the we this area was isolated for so long. One of the things that um, actually Anne's husband, Greg Farley, pointed out to me at one point is that in some ways, this area is like an island or it has historically been like an island. Um, it is connected by land up there at the top, but that's pretty tenuous or, or it's a small connection. And even in my lifetime, the Bay Bridge was somewhat of a new introduction. And uh, it was in my lifetime, I remember a time when it, it was not something that you would just do to hop in the car and go to Annapolis on the spur of the moment. It was a, it was a big deal to go to the Western shore. And so I think that that, um, that geographical isolation has continued to lend a, a different perspective to people who live here and who grew up breathing the air and uh, living in the, in the world here. So with that uh, somewhat rambling introduction, I would like to turn it over to Kyle. I hope that everyone is uh, feeling free to add to the chat or to um, speak up. We have a lot of people, so we might be easiest to stay muted until you wanna raise your hand or something. Welcome, Kyle. Uh, I, I first got to say thank you, Mariah, and uh, you know, for reaching out um, and, and keeping in touch since we first met pre-pandemic. Um, you know, and and um, all the work you're doing with River Arts, it's it's a privilege to be able to share a little more about my paintings with my hometown um, here today. And um, I also just uh, have to take a moment and. Um, say thank you all for joining, you know, um, this late afternoon evening. I see many familiar faces. Uh, Miss Spencer, my high school art teacher is in the house. I see, uh, uh, let's see, Carol is here as well. Uh, Neiman, uh, who's kind of helped fold me back into the community most recently at Kent County. Um, and, you know, um, it's, it's such a rich, I think, I think just that sample of, you know, um, from when I learned art, you know, in high school versus to where I'm at now is here um, and to hopefully be part of the conversation. I want some of the images that I share today to kind of be conversational. Uh, my goal is not to give academic art lecture um, or anything like that, but rather I'll flip through um, some slides of you know, probably more images than I have time. And the hope is to kind of facilitate discussion perhaps uh, in the chat or, you know, to speak up if, if you have some questions about a particular work or a moment. Um, but, you know, the, the disclaimer is that, uh, you know, there's, when, when I put these talks together, 
you know, for every image you see, there's probably 10 paintings that I chose not to put in, right? And so it's actually a curated um, sampling, um, but it also is, I think what Mariah talks about is it's representative of my journey growing up in Still Pond, Maryland, to where I'm at now, um, uh, teaching. I'm currently in my office on campus at James Madison University. And so you're gonna see like the arc, uh, you know, moving through the work as well, um, talking about reference images and, and so forth, um, and also the process. Um, so I hope to kind of, again, uh, have uh, questions and uh, feedback along the way uh, throughout the talk, as opposed to at the end. That way we can, you know, talk about it live while it's, while it's hot, so to speak. Um, so I think I have capability to um, screen share. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and give it a shot here. Um, so. And I'd like to tell everybody, I know we've all been Zooming for a year, so you probably know this, but somewhere on your screen, you might see a little icon with a couple, a little um, grid of dots. And you can click on that, it says view, and you can change to speaker view. So when Kyle shares his screen, you'll be able to see his slides a little bigger. And you can toggle back and forth to see the whole group for discussion if you'd like. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna go ahead and share now, um, and we'll, we'll get started um, with the images. So you should be able to see my screen, um, but I wanna do perhaps, slideshow. Um, so I'll start with this picture here. Um, and I'm going to kind of be toggling some windows and things. So do please bear with me. Um, I'll be able to see the chat live as I kind of flip through. But, you know, this talk is going to be primarily about my studio practices painting and how I'm developing source material through my journey. Um, and I like to start with this image here. Um, it's an installation of my MFA thesis show uh, at MICA, Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, and so I'll kind of move through now um, how I'm thinking about these paintings. If it lets me, here we go. So for me, the studio process really is a proving ground um, you know, experimentation, trial and error across disciplines, rooted in but not limited to. And I think that's always been the undertone of my experience growing up in, you know, Still Palm, Maryland, being rooted in but not limited to, you know, that uh, your roots, so to speak. And so I'm thinking about painting the same way. And at this time, I was interested in um, the image of self and working both in the third dimension and the second dimension, 2D and 3D. And I attempted a life cast here of my face and I attempted to paint it at the same time. And long story short, it didn't work, you know? Um, and this was like the first time I tried something like that, but it was transformative in that I was underneath this goop right here uh, with McDonald's straws uh, in my nose for like 90 minutes or something like that. And it never really set. And so I was kind of trapped uh, beneath the veil. I was um, trying to figure out how to communicate with my studio assistant and uh, they would hand me a piece of paper and I would try to write words to deliver a message to be heard. And, you know, ultimately I think this would lead to me thinking about a portrait as a psychological space, as a space both external and internal. And at the time I'm reading um, Franz Fanon, um, Black Skin, White Masks, talking about the veil. Um, and so there's kind of these moving parts of the studio as a research practice. And for some reason or another, I decided to set up a photo shoot while I was trapped underneath of that because I, I could feel that it wasn't working the way I thought it would, but I knew something important was happening in the studio that perhaps, you know, my, my um, I should say my, the, the technique was a hit of my vision. Um, and so in some ways I was making decisions that I didn't really know what I would do with them later, but I knew it was important. Um, and so there's a sense of documentation um, that 
really uh, worked its way throughout these series of images. The documentation of um, historical figures from the past. And so I created this painting uh, titled Progress After Biddle, referencing Nicholas Biddle, um, arguably the first bloodshed of the Civil War. Um, and ultimately the kind of paintings that I began creating had to do with this notion of the constructed image, both what is seen and what is being viewed, what is the, the kind of two way street of looking. And, um, you know, referencing this photograph of Nicholas Biddle, and my lights are going to go out, by the way, because um, I'm in my office and I have to keep moving. So let's see, here we go. So um, referencing, you know, this image of Nicholas Biddle. Um, you know, was kind of a learning experience in the idea of the reproduction of a photographic image and who's in control of the view, um, you know, and, and, you know, how are sitters objectified uh, as source material in a way. And so this became a very uh, foundational work for me. And with further research, I learned that um, Nicholas Biddle, this, this image of him was also reproduced um, in a visiting card uh, to raise money uh, for the Union uh, troops in the Civil War. And so it was kind of like this duplication, this mass production of, you know, an external view that perhaps the sitter was not in control of. Um, and, you know, um, I began kind of placing myself, staging myself in positions uh, from sitters of the past, the 19th, 20th century uh, photography, getting into that head space and making paintings about it. At the same time, I'm really invested in the history of painting um, and the technical tradition of a method called a seven layer painting method, uh, which is a method um, typically known um, by Dutch masters. Um, and this idea of mastery of technique where artists like Vermeer, you know, for example, would develop a painting rooted in a drawing then an underpainting, then a black and white layer, and then thin layers of color over top. But at the same time, I found it very peculiar that there's uh, certain scenes and imagery that would always exist in this work, certain frames, certain windows and doors, symbolic meaning. Um, but I couldn't connect to that. That was not my experience, you know, growing up uh, where I did. and. Um, you know, in a mixed race household, um, that interior space looked a lot different than um, these Dutch and Flemish paintings. But yet I found something very fascinating about this idea of, again, the constructed image, but in this time, the constructed image in paint, in which this way of working, it would essentially separate color in order to understand form. And I found that a powerful thing. Uh, you know, conceptually and, and also just technically. And so, you know, the next sample of works that I'll kind of move through are really going to be rooted in this unpacking of the constructed image um, to explore race, class, and social standing through self-representation. So if I can take apart these historical techniques, what do I learn? Like, what actually feels genuine to my experiences? Um, you know, in terms of the level of finish. Um, so what I did was I began really staging photographs and thinking about these precarious modes of, of depiction where um, sitters would be placed in these contraptions and held in uncomfortable positions to get the perfect photograph. And so I would set this up in my studio and it became a question about like, how do you want to be seen? Like this image of you is going to represent you and your family and, you know, your legacy and it's going to outlive you. Um, and the measures in which individuals would go through in order to get that, um, you know, uh, perfect ideal version of themselves is almost this chasing of that. And I became obsessed with that and combined that with the seven layer painting method working uh, drawings and underpainting, slowly building up a surface 
thinking again about the construction of a painting um, as I am the construction of the sitter, really. Um, you know, I became obsessed with how things were framed, staged, and certain components of the painting would be braced into position. Um, but there was a certain level of, for me, distrust in the image. And so, you know, what's real and what's fake? And so there's these certain areas that I would leave exposed. Um, so in this image, the wood down there is actually the raw material of the, um, the wood panel that I made the painting on. Um, but, you know, I think like another important part about like the next few images that I'm thinking about is this, you know, while I'm referencing uh, contraptions, braces and postures from early uh, photography, I'm thinking about how that might objectify or hold someone in place, fix somebody into a position, but this is unstable. You know, that's how I'm kind of thinking about it. And I find that there's this dynamic perception of freedom and being able to organize how one presents itself, presents themselves. And, you know, Nicholas Biddle didn't necessarily have that privilege in that original image. Um, and so I'm kind of tapping into that space in the next works here and um, really trying to explore the tensions between the outward appearance and the internal psyche of, you know, who I'm depicting. Um, and really these are all self-referential um, kind of moving forward here. And the interesting thing about this was it ended up um, making its way on a billboard uh, in Baltimore a while back. And so again, like this distancing, this reproduction of the image I found important, um, you know, who's in control of that view. And so I'm going to kind of move around a little bit, you know, um, across time here in no particular order, uh, chronological order, but thinking about connections between the work, these are images from a show uh, with uh, my gallery in Baltimore, Goya Contemporary, um, that I had titled Negation. Now the title of this show says it all, you know, this kind of uh, canceling out of a view, canceling out of a subject, right? And so this is an installation shot. Feel free, if y'all have questions too, um, let me know, I can go through things. Um, you know, I certainly don't wanna um, turn this into like a artist talk either. Um, so please feel free to interject uh, with questions or leave something in the chat. I'm sure we'll have some good questions. Kyle, I was, I was wondering if, who decided to put that image on that billboard? Oh, interesting. So I feel like this was like, I think when this billboard was first constructed and now it's been up for a while and I feel like there's more advertisements now than there are artists, like images of art, you know, the irony behind it. Um, I feel like it may have been something you apply for or I got invited to like submit images um, during the time. And for me, actually the funny story about this was I wasn't living in Baltimore at the time. I was living in New York and it wasn't until it almost felt like it wasn't until I left Baltimore that then the image got on that screen. And um, I had friends and everybody in Baltimore um, saying, hey, Kyle, you got, you know, and they were <laughs> sharing pictures with me. And I was like, I got to get back down and, and get see that for myself, you know? And it was surreal, you know? Because I remember exactly what happened in the studio when I made that painting. And to see that on the, you know, really above the cityscape was very powerful for me. Kyle, yeah, when you go back to looking at, at these from this um, show, I was curious about if you could talk about the seven layer painting technique, just briefly in relation to me. Um, so you cut out a little bit, but I think I get the gist. So kind of unpack the seven layer painting technique a little more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this technique yes, is a, um, I think in many ways is, um, considered the cream of the crop in terms of the literal structure of a painting. Um, it's a process in which uh, clarified deliberate layers of drawing um, and then seven layers of painting as a indirect method to create an image. So instead of like taking wet paint on wet paint and creating an image all at once, artists would create a drawing 
the underpainting and let that underpainting dry for seven days and then come back to it and then work another underpainting and let that dry for another seven days and then work the um, black and white layer, which is called, um, I like to call it the did color layer, um, but it would be called the Griselle layer. And essentially what it does is it models form. So it models value, uh, light, shadow, and so forth on top of that. But what's underneath has to be dry. And um, I found that very compelling. First of all, who has that kind of time, that luxury of time to make a painting and then wait a week in between each layer? And some artists would sand in between each layer. So it was such a formulaic fixed method that I felt like you know, what happens if I take that apart and find the vulnerabilities in that? And how can I talk about my own insecurities of race, class, and social standing? Um, because also during that time, you know, people that look like me didn't have that insider knowledge of how to make this seven layer painting, um, you know, or that time, right? Like it's, you know, like painting is not a, like that way of painting is not practical at all. And um, so there's something uh, very interesting about this, for me anyways, this privileged notion of insider knowledge that I'm really trying to get in the hit space of in working through this seven layer painting method. Um, but, uh, you know, after the black and white color layers, uh, artists would then do um, glazes, thin layers of color over top, and it was, um, you know, a cumulative effect of color. And so when you look at, you know, an artist like Vermeer, the painting surface looks like stained glass. Um, it it's, has a kind of sheen to it. And I was very attracted to this false glamorization of the surface, this seductive surface that draws you in, but then it shows you underneath of it how vulnerable it might be. Um, you know, and, and that's what I felt was more genuine to me out of that, that seven layer painting method. But um, Art conservationists, they say that this, that's the most like structural sound paintings over time and they hold up well, so. Kyle, do you have a, a plan when you do your floors? I notice in this one, you know, it's, it's a directed out to the viewer. I felt that the one that you had that was on the billboard, the floor is actually done in a really vertical way so that it's as if he's not really standing on anything it just it can slide off yeah he's hanging he's you know? hanging he is and that's exactly right like the image is unstable um there's the kind of sliding around of what's on top um and right now it's still very formative in, in an image like this um and even in an image like this i should say this is on canvas and i don't paint on canvas often um, because I'm really interested in the materiality of the surface. Um, but um, at this show, we spent a lot of time thinking about how high this painting was hung and how the wood grain that I painted related to kind of the wood floor. So, yeah, but, um, you know, it, it's a kind of organized chaos in terms of painting the floorboards. I mean, it feels like, uh, you know, literally um, constructing the scene I'm literally constructing the space and um, throughout my journey, the painting and the studio space have often been some of the most secure spaces where I felt like I had license and control of things. And so there's a certain amount of that too, is like it's, it's um, you know, an opportunity for me to reimagine, uh, you know, my truth outside of any external factors. So I felt like I was building a room, so to speak, in this one. And erasing it to the extent that actually this painting is titled after end and uh was the reference photograph was created in my last apartment i lived in in baltimore so it's about kind of a state of becoming and coming to terms with the next steps and i feel i feel a lot like that when i'm making the paintings you know they really are about kind of tapping into that in-between space, the simultaneous understanding of uh, this image is permanent and it's also not permanent. This image will erase itself. And up close, you'd be able to see little formal, you know, clues on this where the chair doesn't actually touch the ground, things like that. 
Um, but you know, you're not really able to get to that unless you spend time looking through the image. And I'm really thinking about, um, you know, how certain positions and postures allow for more consumable views. So this is much less confrontational than the other one, um, you know, painted directly on the wood panel. And your floor line isn't straight. Exactly. It's a slight, it's a slight kind of tipping and, and bowing. And I actually like sanded into this painting too. So it was a weird painting for me to make. I didn't, I didn't really trust the painting when I finished it. Um, but you know, it seemed to kind of do its job and it took about two years, um, not because it took two years to paint, but because uh, I was traveling through different residencies and so forth. And um, you know, at that time I changed. And so I couldn't paint the old version of me. I had to kind of relook at and repaint, reconsider things. So I would wipe the face off numerous times, wipe the hand off numerous times. And you'll see me, it's, it's yeah, it's a strange kind of process. Um, it's a very kind of non-linear way of working in the studio. Can you explain um, what you mean by saying that you didn't trust the painting? Absolutely. And I think like uh, even this one, you know, is a good example of that. But when I say I don't trust the painting is, um, you know, does, and, and I, I think this is a conflict that many artists might face, but does the painting match and measure up to your own expectations of it? My paintings never do, um, never. And they, you know, ultimately kind of point towards the next work. Um, and one of the struggles that I had like early on was I would try to make one painting that would change the world or like one painting that would say it all. And it's like, no, not at all. Make a body of work, work through the idea. And, you know, that's kind of what, what that painting was about uh, for me, um, just the after end, was it actually, this was the first one, and I didn't see this until later, but what I didn't trust was kind of the fragility of the background and the introspection. At the time, I hadn't had many paintings kind of that I made using this kind of consumable view, where really the center of the surface is like the chest is like the, the core of the, the figure, you know? Um, and, you know, um, so it's a kind of new, a newness to it at the time that, again, I think that the technique was a bit ahead of my vision. Like I was doing things, but I didn't really know why. So I didn't trust it. And even the static I call in the background, the texture, you'll see that come up in some uh, new images of my work. And, and, you know, you'll see it a kind of full circle. But I think that's the exciting part, too in painting is, you know, um, painting, it, 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 it really is a living record in conversation with the past that contends with the material present and presents future possibilities. Um, it's just complicated when you're making the painting, you're not always aware of what future opportunities it might make. But, you know, my, my belief in painting is that as soon as you, you know, pick up that brush, you, you contend with its complicated histories and the fragility of the question, how do you know what you know, right? Like, can you trust an image? Can you trust who made it? Is this image for you? Does this image represent your life experiences? And I think at best, that's what art can do. Um, and so for me, you know, it, it's very much also about like this um, process of kind of undoing as well, um, you know, myself. And so uh, by making these images, I'm not trying to create a genuine portrait that captures my spirit. And I never say they're self-portraits. I'm always careful. They're self-referential. Um, so they end up not looking like me. They're not really meant to. They're meant to kind of embody something else, something greater than, and often tied to history. Um, and that goes back to like the, the Nicholas Biddle. And, you know, so it's a psychological space, really. How much does surrealism affect you or you because there's a very surreal quality to this double portrait this is wonderful the the lapel and the the suit and all that but the two heads are are different sizes and the collar and neck don't kind of match up in the front one so you get a little you know his head is 
a slightly different angle and it's a little smaller and just kind of an interesting perspective on you. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate you pointing that out. I'm glad it actually reads um, in the image. Um, but this was the first double portrait I created. Mm -hmm. and essentially, those formal elements you just pointed out is exactly what I was after. And so by kind of having a, a you know, two types of gray pigments, mm -hmm. um, one greener, one bluer, one thicker, the image in the front thicker, turning closer to the viewer, um, and higher, and then the one behind it here, thinner and lower, I was creating my own social structures. I was actually creating my own race in a way by mixing grays. And Are you familiar with Amy Sherald's gray faces? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, you know, I have to say at the time, I wasn't. And we were both in Baltimore. I know, we're, you were. Yeah. And, um, but for me, this was, I think, a painting in which... Um, I'm also thinking about the history, the legacy of a double portrait, doubling, bonding, and the family ties that that kind of traditionally talks about, right? Typically, these would be siblings or, um, you know, marriage images. So, like, there's this bond together, despite them being handled differently. And, um, yeah, so I, I learned a lot from this one as well. But uh, it was very kind of, again, I, I think like a formative work for me um, in thinking about the hierarchy of and becoming obsessed with mixing my own grades. So like at this time, I'm, I'm using only primary colors and mixing up all my paint during the daytime. And if it wasn't right, if it wasn't the right temperature of green, I would redo it, you know, and, and so it wasn't kind of just a generic um, underpainting at this point. I was really thinking about the sensitivity of color. Um, and so kind of jumping ahead, you know, thinking about uh, work that was also in that show um, in Baltimore, um, this one here titled Rate of Contingency. And if we zoom in, you can maybe see what I'm talking about in terms of the materiality in the image. And so when I make the connection between um, you know, the static in the previous painting titled After End, the seated figure, the large scale figure. I'm still thinking about that in 2018, that's two years later. But I think in this way, more, um, I think more specifically with intention in how the brushed aluminum uh, relates to the gestural mark that holds color, that kind of holds, um, you know, the energy. And so it really is about this uh, image being dependent on or contingent to the light source and how it's seen by the viewer. And so it's difficult to photograph, but in person, if the viewer moves, the image changes as well. Um, and, you know, the, it's hard to see, but um, there's red fiery underpaintings underneath it here. Um, so I'm no longer using the academic um, foundational seven layer painting technique, but I'm thinking about bright, and you can kind of see it, I think here, um, I'm using bright fire underneath of subdued grays. Um, and that'll be kind of a, a thing that comes up in, you know, the next few images. Um, and there goes my light again. But this is kind of another part of that show, um, the installation shot. So I began making, experimenting more on aluminum and um, working in a self-referential way. But at the same time, um, I had, well, prior to this, I had been teaching. Um, so I kind of entered academia, um, but on the other side, um, you know, as a faculty member. And I found it very um, important to kind of self-reflect on this external internal view. And I, I would say one of the important things about this painting was that I'm actually scratching the aluminum surface. And so like what you see up here is actually, um, I'm taking like sandpaper and I'm thinking about the agitation. I'm thinking about the, the image as being animated and also a sensory experience. So it's not just, you know, about the picture I'm creating. It's about kind of slowing down the view and getting underneath of the surface, suspending judgment. Um, in order to kind of understand um, the 
what I like to call conflict beneath formality. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more because um, this ended up uh, becoming a body of work. Actually, I'm still working through. Um, but at the same time, I had the privilege to um, speak at uh, two of my former schools. So I had the privilege to speak at University of Delaware, um, which was an amazing experience. And then in 2019 um, at Kent County High School, another amazing experience. And, you know, not only that, but also being, you know, a faculty member um, and attending various, it seems like so long ago, in-person <laughs> graduations and things like that. There's, this, you know, there's certain kind of um, symbolisms and ceremonial kind of uh, traditions that even the people doing them may not understand. Um, there's a, particularly at the college level, you know, the president comes out with a staff, a mace, and certain kind of coded symbols. And there's this deep kind of history there rooted in hierarchical framing and, you know, what kind of color hood you have, um, you know, and even the students you see maybe in some of these, the caps, right? We're all the same, but we're gonna to try to embellish our, our caps and make that us. You know, we're gonna to try to make this represent our personal voice. Um, and, and faculty would do that as well. And I found that very intriguing um, in so far where we sometimes forget that despite this kind of, um, you know, hierarchical distinction of a color or a metal or what you're carrying, there's a person underneath it there. You know, there's an experience, there's a family, there's a root underneath it there. And, um, you know, I began really thinking about that as a sensory experience for the paintings. And I made work that looked like this. Um, and I'll kind of show some more recent stuff as, as well um, that continue to pick up on that. But so the interesting thing in like the next few works is then I made a painting about that painting. And so, the painting after judgment is in the background there with the photograph, a reference photograph of that painting. And so I'm thinking about that distancing, that doubling, right? Who's in control of that image, that reproduction of the image. And at the same time, continuing to, you know, experiment with the surface. Um, what happens if I sand back part of the painted form, sand back the veil. Um, what happens if uh, I use these uh, fiery underpaintings um, or a kind of, in this one was one of the first ones where I used a pink underpainting. And it's hard to see up there, but the red tries to breathe through. And that becomes important, um, you know, in terms of the, the layers of the work. Um, so I'm really thinking about the movement, not just, you know, of the image, but even um, what, what I like to call the Z axis through the image there and the kind of turning. Um, and that continues um, in even some of the newer works, but sometimes more explicitly referencing uh, political uh, poses. And so I was actually thinking about like a, a pose of a politician, for example, emerging that with just random objects in the studio and, and curtains. Um, and the interesting thing is, you know, I made this painting at about the same time that I had a show at Baltimore City Hall, where I got to meet the former mayor um, at the time. And I had a private walkthrough of a public show with the mayor of Baltimore City. Um, and so there was this interesting kind of public view, um, but it was a private kind of walkthrough. Um, and we, you know, uh, and, and the paintings in many ways were doing that. And, and so it's interesting sometimes how the work can lead you to the political spaces, even though I'm not explicitly, not always explicitly talking about that in the work itself. Um, so one of probably the more important, uh, probably more recognized political images of my paintings is this one here titled After Brown. This one was one of the ones early on that was written about in the Huffington Post. Um, 
And this painting was a very powerful moment for me um, as a painting, but also as kind of a, a connection to a personal story, a personal journey where um, at the time, and so I'm referencing this image here um, of abolitionist John Brown and um, this daguerreotype made by African-American photographer, Augustus Washington. And this is when John Brown declares war on slavery. Um, and so he's testifying. And at the time I made the painting, I was away from home and I had a family member facing incarceration and I had no way of being heard. And so I had to make a painting about it in the spirit of testifying. And one of the uh, important parts I think about this just in terms of painting was that I ran out of patience to actually paint every individual finger. And I was at Vermont Studio Center at like four in the morning. And so instead of um, you know, painting my finger, I actually just dipped my hand in paint and pressed it onto the aluminum panel. And in some ways for me, that represented a way to authenticate a way to identify myself, you know, and I, I'm thinking about the fingerprinting and, you know, all of that as well, but there's this direct distance of the surface of the painting and the person that made it. And um, for me, that, that is really what I, I am invested in as a painter. And I think that's what separates painting from any other medium um, and particularly photography is, whereas in photography, you don't always know how far away the subject was from the lens. But when you look at a painting and you're standing arm's length away, you're in the same position that that painter was when they made it. And something happens at that kind of magic distance um, where you begin to see how the work unfolds, if you're willing to look that way. And um, you know that's, that's kind of what this painting was about. And it was also the first one that I did on aluminum at that time. So I think that's the end of, I think, many of the figurative works. Um, and I want to move, oh, so that's how I made it. Um, but so I, this is a staged image. That's not actually the moment when I press my hand on it, but just to give you a sense. And similar to Kent County, like up in Vermont, where we were at in Johnson, Vermont, you didn't wear that orange for fashion or style. You wore that for protection, you know? And it was interesting because that orange started to make its way into my work in the previous image, referencing, you know, being marked um, in the criminal justice system, thinking about the orange jumpsuit, but also in this way, being marked so that you're protected, um, you know, in the woods, right? Um, so it was interesting in some ways how that environment can change uh, and, and maybe make its way into your work. Um, oh, so, Again, kind of picking up on some of that idea of like the distancing um, of the kind of figure to the, the picture plane. This is a kind of newer body of work that I'm developing, thinking about how a silhouette can authenticate presence and proximity to a space. Um, so basically the scale of the silhouette shows you how close a person was to that you know, surface. Um, and this is something that's ongoing, but um, you know, in some ways it relates to that kind of handprint. There's a directness uh, in the surface of the image here. But so, you know, there's multiple bodies of work, multiple channels happening at the same time. And for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of go through um, some of these and I'll kind of give you a little snippet of what I'm thinking about, you know, in these body of works. And so this silhouette piece is exactly that. I'm thinking about the constructed image but um, proximity to the surface. And the closer you get, uh, the more you can see beneath the surface. And so I'm actually putting tape directly in the paint and then masking out tape. So there's this one-to-one -one relationship of scale, just like how my hand was one-to-one -one in that past image. Um, more recent work dealing with that. This one right now is up in uh, Connecticut, I think. Um, at the Eli Contemporary Center for Art in the show. Something to note in this one is that there's actual tape, the green here. And then I painted the green at the top and the bottom. 
And so there's this facade of what's holding the view in place, right? Like who's in control of that. And so, you know, you could peel the tape on the edges off and it's free on the sides, but it's constrained on the top. So if I zoom in, you can begin to see beneath. And so, I'm, you know, you can see the drips and the layers of the gesso board and even kind of the gestural um, graphite being contained by the shape of the shirt. But you know, like these are paintings too, that again, I'm, I'm inviting a view. I'm, in, I'm inviting a view so that you can get inside of the head of the sitter, right? And um, you know, that, that kind of is a common theme really throughout all those portraits. So many of those portraits <laughs> work out. And that, that is kind of like my, my punchline right there with the crumpling. <laughs> I can't resist. I always say I'm going to take it out, but I'm like, no, I, I can't. I'm sorry. Um, but many of those, uh, those images don't work. And so they become discarded photographs. And so I ended up reclaiming this image that failed, this image that didn't work, and ultimately creating Vanitas still life paintings um, about those images. And so essentially, you know, this work evolved into crumpling discarded exhibition cards and then making paintings about them. And so the next few, see really series of images are gonna be about that body of work. Um, this uh, kind of grouping of work, this recent grouping of work, thinking about uh, maybe more uh, explicit references to um, functional items like tools, fixtures and braces that hold these crumpled images, these crumpled pieces of paper in place, working on wood panel, aluminum, thinking about compression, twisting of the image, doubling, binding an image together, hanging an image, the figure ground. So this actually is the uh, aluminum of the uh, panel and then I'm actually painting the metal and you can see kind of the orange underneath it here. So there's a lot about being constrained. There's, you know, something underneath. This work was in an exhibition at Summoner Hall, which seems like so long ago. And it was the first time I actually just showed this work together. Um, Kyle, I just noticed that we're, um, we're getting close to six. So I just, um, I'm so fascinated. I really don't want to cut you off, but I also want to make sure that we are um, aware of our time. Yeah, so I, I just a little, just a little. Um, so I'll kind of flag. through these, um, you know, and pretty much the overall idea is the same throughout. Um, and then I'll end in some more recent uh, images of my work, uh, you know, that are still in the studio today. And maybe we can have uh, any questions at the end. Um, yeah. So you see me kind of combining the silhouette and other kind of, uh, you know, the crumpled still life objects. But like for me, the, the thing too about um, these still life paintings is that they in, in some ways um, are about this longing. So like the crumpling the failure happens in 10 seconds, you know, it's discarded very quickly. But then what happens if you spend 200 hours painting that? That painting becomes a reflection of this revisionist history, this interest in revising oneself, um, this interest in kind of compression and, and, and so forth. And so that's really what I'm thinking about, but then also, it becomes now a, a 2D image becomes an object. So it becomes objectified. And so, you know, these earlier works, I began to kind of from my pocket, pull out things from my pocket and put them on the tabletop. Um, and that leads me to, I think this is the last one. That just leads me to some more recent stuff uh, that I'll share with you. So this is my uncle, Larry Wilson. Um, I had a chance to meet him um, at the uh, New Marina 
Um, and it, it changed everything because I didn't know he was my uncle. And it turned out he was the president of Sumner Hall. And it turned out he had images of my grandfather who I never had a chance to meet or ever see. And this was the first image of him that I ever saw that was given to me, or at least a digital copy by Larry. And I actually used that in the painting at Sumner Hall. Um, you know, and, and the interesting thing was when I painted this face, it was very familiar. It was like I was painting that face all along, you know? And so it was a powerful kind of moment for me um, in the studio. And also Larry introduced me to my family that served in the Union Army uh, in the Civil War, uh, Private John Hackett. And this is some of the new work um, that I'm thinking about. And you kind of see the outcome, you know, and things like that. And so now I'm, I'm sourcing, uh, you know, family connection to those, um, you know, Civil War era photographs and I'm pretending to, you know, and getting in a psychological headspace of what it would mean to be a serviceman during that time. And so this is some work that's still going on in the studio. And I'm also still thinking about the regalia um, as well. And uh, developed in that body of work. Um, and so I'm not in my home studio right now, so I don't have that. Otherwise, I'd show you. Um, but here's some images and a detail of that. And I think that's it. Yeah. So thank you. Um, I know we are over time, but I have time. If anybody has any questions, um, you know, I can, I'll stop the share if I can. And I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have or about anything, the painting, the journey, my background. Kyle, thank you. That was amazing. And I think we were all just kind of spellbound and to see the aluminum, I've seen a couple of things in comments here, you know, about loving the way you use graphite oil and aluminum. I think people have really just appreciated your perspective and the storytelling that you wrap around all of your work. And yeah, if anybody else has questions that you've been holding, now's the time. A comment, Kyle? Okay? Yeah, good to see you. <laughs> with pieces in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I get to sit every day. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. And so Jay was at um, the Rehoboth Arts League and that image, um, he helped curate and put together that solo show. So it's very familiar with the work in person. And um, yeah, it's like I said, it's yeah, I'm a fan, yeah. being part of this too. For me, that's the rewarding thing is like folks that are here is kind of the community that is my support, you know, as part of the journey. Um, and so I'm happy to kind of share that with everybody. Um, any other um, questions? Hi, Kyle. <laughs> I like to see the orange tooths there. <laughs> I don't know. You remember me, I was um, at VSC as well. Yes, uh, absolutely. Back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I just, yeah, yeah, hey. <laughs> So Stephanie um, yeah. was an artist when I was at Vermont Studio Center. Um, mm. Thank you for joining. I really yeah. appreciate it. I saw it come by on Facebook. So I wanted to just, I was like really like the last second joined in. But um, I don't know if you think of this at all now, but because um, so much of your work, um, you know, how you were talking about how your, um, the figure, was sort of hanging on the one with the wood vertical mm -hmm. background. And it reminds me now, like just in the last year of the speed of image making and like removing backgrounds from figures. And like, I realized actually I have that right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, but we just, um, and it sort of helps us create a persona in a way like and we isolate and time travel and travel from place to place and I can't help but see that now even though this is like very new technology but mm -hmm. I think it's just kind of interesting how it just your work really shows us time um, and slowing down time and um, looking at the past but also always the figure isolated and the sort of instability of the image and not trusting what's real um, I just really see that through our yeah con super contemporary image making 
and super rapid. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, for me, it's been this past year, you know, during the pandemic has been very reflective too. I think Stephanie to your comment, because it's like, there's, um, I think coming to terms with the sense of uh, solitude in my work as well, in a sense of kind of mm -hmm. emptying oneself into the image um, and um, particularly that image with like the blue background as well. Like I made that one during the pandemic and okay. it's a figure kind of staring at a wall, you know? And it is gonna be interesting when we all look back on this time, painting is a living document at this particular moment in time. Really everything we do very well could be. Um, so yeah, no, I appreciate you uh, bringing that out. I'm very interested in kind of that slow looking Um, so we have a, a question in the chat from Pat Dietz from Still Pond, and she said she's Ramallah's mom, and she says, <laughs> "When did you get become interested in art and a serious student on a path?" Ooh, <laughs> oh man, that's another talk right there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh man, um, I was always interested in art. Um, growing up in Still Pond, right, you know, it's, it was kind of like we were, you know, we didn't have much, it was working class, we were poor, um, you know, you didn't have something, you made it, it was a DIY kind of mentality. Um, and so I was always very hands on. And that was always the first option It's like, if I don't have it, I'm going to make it, it was never go out and buy it. Um, and so for me, from the very beginning, um, it was almost like the drawing, right, and I would make comic books, and I would create my own worlds, my own imagined spaces. And um, that was kind of where it started. I remember folding up notebook paper and making Sonic the Hedgehog comic books. And I also had a brother-in-law at the time that was um, an incredible artist. And, um, you know, we weren't related by blood, but um, he would, you know, draw at our kitchen table, Power Rangers and things like that. And I would watch him kind of render images and so forth and I'd have to go to bid. And then the first thing I would do is try to peek in the sketchbook in the morning to see what would happen. But I would sit right up there at the kitchen table with him and you know, draw as well. And so I was definitely around that kind of making space um, early on. And so it was like always, always there. It wasn't always at the forefront, um, you know, but it was always there and it was something, I guess perhaps that that is what, um, you know, I could trust in a way was that um, the ability to kind of make something out of nothing, uh, you know, even if it's simple art materials. Um, and let's see the other part, a serious student on a path. Um, I was always like a, like, I guess, good student. I don't know, maybe Miss Spencer, you can... <laughs> <laughs> talk to that. Um, I don't know. I guess I was somebody like in, in terms of students, like it was always, it was like engineering and art for me. It was kind of, to me, the same thing, interchangeable, um, because it was like this DIY culture, you make things. And, but ultimately what it was is like, how do you know what you know? How do I stimulate curiosity? How am I in an environment that does that? And um, it wasn't really until Obviously, like uh, art classes and things like that, you know, you're in that arts community. Um, but, you know, I didn't actually study art uh, for my first year in college. I studied engineering and um, like it was OK, but I wasn't as invested. And then I actually switched over into fine art, um, I think, like my sophomore year. But I'm a first generation college student as well. So just even, you know, making it that far was such a privilege and kind of like uncharted territory and uh, so thankful for that support. And so it wasn't really until um, probably, you know, like the undergrad at University of Delaware where I realized that um, it wasn't just about kind of making images that looked good technically, uh, but that I had something to say with what I was making. and. Um, Ultimately, that led me to go to graduate school at MICA, Maryland Institute of College of Art for painting, was that I wasn't necessarily getting the nutrients anymore that I needed in terms of content development of me talking about race, class, and social standing, my lived experience um, 
as a biracial artist, you know, of color making art in, in you know, the 2010s during that time. And so I, I had to go to graduate school to get that, to get beyond the technical critique, to get into the deeper conceptual critique. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it, it developed, but uh, perhaps the volition was there, you know, I just, maybe that's something that was cultivated over time though. And it, was, it wasn't really until like the, the end of undergrad, grad school, I think, where I realized that that's also something that's, and, and now teaching, like it's hard to teach that. You can't really, the volition to will to make in the first place, um, you know, and so trying to find the intersections of that is always what I'm striving for. That was a long run on, but that's kind of a short, you know, um, kind of a snippet of the journey. <laughs> How proud are you, Miss Spencer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the words. <laughs> no, Kyle's always been a fantastic person. Um, I still have a couple pieces tucked away in my classroom. I'm gonna save them. <laughs> I gotta come back and check them out when we <laughs> Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, I'd love to have you back. You know that. Absolutely. Well, I think this um, maybe breaks the record for the longest salon. We're usually <laughs> um, pretty good about trying to get people uh, released in time to go eat their dinners, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't cut you off, Kyle, I, and I could listen to you and look at what you are showing us for hours more. So I hope that you will maybe come back and do another one sometime. I'd be happy to. I can't. I, uh, does anybody have a last last minute question or comment before we turn it over to Anne for a, a toast and a goodbye? Well, I want to. Uh, give you a round of applause and yeah we we always end with a toast so we'll let ann do that yeah. and i will say it's a pleasure to meet you tonight you and maria had so many conversations i was really looking forward to this but i learned so much i always take a few notes so that i can have stuff to share with our readers um, and members who weren't here this evening and i learned a lot as an artist just as a person um, and really appreciate it for somebody who's trying to make work, but sometimes like about the fact that it doesn't always work and that, you know, maybe something you're doing is part of a larger body of work. So that's really helpful. But the thing I want to end, one of the first things you said, how you can be rooted in, limited to them. Given our experience in the pandemic in the past year and your story, I just, I really wanted and remember that. So thank you for being here and for showing all of us about not place, but keeping your roots there. And cheers. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all for joining me. I feel the support and community and I look forward to keeping in touch with everybody and sharing more. You are welcome to come back anytime. This was really, really great. Thank you so much. I learned more than I can tell you. I'll be thinking about this for a long time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye. Thanks again, Kyle. Bye. Yeah.